Now again, find the CEO, the president. Their main goal is to drive profit for that business. But until the CEO realizes that the HR department can and really is a true analytical and data-driven profit driver instead of a sunk cost, which it most likely is, if you could make that shift at the CEO level and bring that HR person on board, great things are going to happen. So what should HR focus on? I mean, if you had to boil it down to just a couple KPIs, what would those be? And so I was actually on a Zoom call with a good buddy of mine who actually runs his own consulting business. And, and he asked a couple of these questions here. And, you know, of course, uh, after the very informative answer of, well, it depends, you know, I started listing off a couple uh, KPIs that kind of came to mind. And, and, and since well, it depends is actually kind of a correct answer and knowing that every business is different, right? I mean, compliance and regulatory um, concerns might be different for one versus the other or talent pools may be different for one or the other, depending on the market and or the location of where the business is at. You know, I thought I put together just kind of six kind of key KPIs that um, I think HR should focus on in 2021 and forward, regardless of the business and or the industry that they're in. So now to start, I imagine we all know what a KPI is, but just in case, just want to make sure. So a KPI is a key performance indicator. It's a quantifiable measure used to evaluate the success of an organization or an employee, etc., in meeting objectives for performance. So on to KPI number one, and this one's employee productivity rate. Now, this may seem simple and very uh, kind of easy to kind of calculate, and that is by simply taking the, call it the values of the goods or units served or produced, divided that by the input of man hour. Now, this calculation can actually become very complex, and if you do it correctly, you could actually realize the true capacity and for growth in terms of production and human capital. So it's not just how much did this person work and how many widgets did they turn out you know, on the manufacturing line. You know, how can we streamline this process and how effective are we here? And really, this will help you dive down to who those key individuals are, but also how you can make improvements and how you can drive efficiency and so forth. So again, while this is very simple, it can be very complex. And if you make it complex, your business will thank you for it later. Okay, so on to KPI number two, internal promotion rate. So now I made a video uh, last week in regards to how we should really focus in HR employers and employees should really focus on upskilling and reskilling in the market to come in the future. Uh, and this kind of leads to that point, right? I mean, the key point here is that internal hires, right? So internal promotions called from a supervisor to a manager or a manager to a director or so forth, they usually hit the ground running with a lot more speed. They hit the ground running quicker. Uh, they reduce the risk of a bad hire, so to speak, because you promoted them from within. And they typically stay in the job a lot longer. Now, measuring this, again, not too difficult to do, but what this does, if you manage it correctly, you could actually reduce drastically the cost for outside hires, but also cut those retention costs because you are promoting from within the key drivers and the key members that are really gonna drive your business home. Now, KPI number three, that's net promoter score for employees. Now, most of us know net promoter score from kind of gauging how much our clients or our customers like us, right? They're either detractors, their passes, or their you know promoters, or what we'd like to get all of our clients to, and that is raving fans, right? They want you want us to tell everybody about how how great we're doing, the wonderful products and services that we have here at XYZ Company, right? And we also take into account the Yelp effect. Now, the Yelp effect is essentially saying that if I have a bad experience, say, at a restaurant, I'm more likely to comment and say how terrible the service was and how the food was cold and how, you know, they gave me chicken, but I wanted steak or whatever the case is. We're more likely to do that if we have a bad experience than if we have a positive experience. That's the Yelp effect. Now, this could actually drive your recruitment center because if you have great net promoter scores from your employees, you can actually take that as a part of a recruiting strategy and saying, hey, look, how wonderful our company is. And if you don't take our word for it, take a look at what the 56 different employees that we have have said about us and the wonderful things. So focus on driving employee satisfaction and that net promoter score for employees to help drive recruiting. KPI number four, 
account management. Now we're going to kind of break this down to three different parts. First one is going to be like your 90 day quit rate. Now you may need to change that over to a, like a, a six month or a 12 month, depending on your organization. But the general idea here is once I hire somebody, once I bring somebody on board and we're through the onboarding process, they're in their job, what's the likelihood that they're going to leave within that mark? Now, again, we just spent lots of money to onboard this person, to get them signed up for the benefits, to get them signed up for all the things. And if they leave within 90 days, that is a really expensive cost. And not just that, but I've also lost product, you know, productivity because they're still learning the job, right? So I have less productivity there. Now I have a hole that I got to fill with overtime and or, you know, hiring gig workers, contractors that kind of filled that shortfall in labor. So if you could focus on that 90 day, or maybe it's 180 days or 365, whatever that case may be, that could help you drive revenue and keeping good talent on. Now, the second part of this is really the quality of the hire. So I brought somebody on, they're staying, you know, 90 days, six months, whatever the case may be. We want to make sure that we gauge how well they're doing. And that's generally done through performance reviews, right? So whether it's a peer to peer, a 360 up and down, you know, whatever the case may be, and or if it's just a manager peer review, we want to make sure that we actually have that annotated because that will help us to kind of help us find the right metrics that we did when we hired Dustin or whoever came on board, how well they did and the things we liked about it, right? So that's how we're going to measure that kind of that quality of hire. And the last piece of this right here is really, it comes down to the recruitment funnel effectiveness, right? So if I take the funnel, look at here, here's the interest, here's all the applicants that come through, here's the first stage of interviews, here's the presentation, here's the hands-on, whatever the case may be. Once I get down all the way to the hire, What's the process like? Now, the reason why this is important, because if you break this down according to the funnel, is it actually allow you to look and see at what stage was I driving excitement? At what stage were most applicants leaving? Because if you know that it's the second interview piece, maybe they're burnt out already, or maybe they get excited at that point because then they get to talk to the manager, the person who they'd be working with and really connect with him. And so it's really important to take a look at that and say, hey, great, at this stage, we drove excitement. At this stage, we had the most exits. Now that allows you to adjust to make sure that you're painting the right picture and the right culture fits for your applicants. KPI number five, turnover rates. Again, three different types here. We have the involuntary, we've got the voluntary, and then we've got the unwanted. Now, again, a lot of us capture the turnover rate in regards to puppy working from home. Am I right? Anyways, a lot of us capture the turnover rates mainly because of, you know, we want to capture who's leaving and who's coming and going and everything, right? But it's also important to break this down by those three different levels, right? So we have the involuntary, right? So this is employer led. Maybe it's a, a recurring absentee employee or someone who just could not figure out how to do the job, right? Right. So this is kind of be involuntary for the employee and therefore, that makes sense, right? The other one's voluntary. This could be, okay, great, you know what? Um, I'm moving across the country. I have family things where I got to move out of state um, and or I just found a better option. But the, the third thing here that we don't really capture too much and that's unwanted turnover. So if I take all of my turnover, whether it's involuntary or voluntary, we need to look at the unwanted. And what this simply means is I'm going to focus on those good performers. I'm going to focus on those key performers who did great things in my organization and look at it as a percentage of who is leaving compared to everybody else. The reason why this is important, of course, your good performers, they're your top sales reps. They're your top, you know, line supervisors. They're your top managers who really drive the focus and the vision for your company forward. You know, and if you lose those, you'll lose a lot more than just an hourly worker. You learn and you lose a lot of your key people. And so that's why it's very important to break that down, not just the voluntary and voluntary, but really take a look at your unwanted turnover. And KPI number six, absentee. So when I look at the absentee rate and the absentee cost, it's very important to break those two things down, right? Because I know that if I could really gauge, you know, what my absentee rate is, right? So how many times is Dustin going to call out this month? You know, did the Jets win? Probably not. But if they did, is he going to call out again, right? So breaking down the rate at which absentee happens, that's very important for us to know. But also, I think more importantly is to break down the cost of the absentee, right? So the CDC actually found, and this is going back to, I think, 2018 numbers, what it is, but it costs roughly $1,700 per employee per year. Now to break that down to you, if you have a 50 employee company, that's going to cost you 
on average, about $85,000 a year. And so if I understand the rate and I understand the reasons why they're doing that, and I could uncover the underlying reasons for absenteeism, I then can really focus on the cost that is actually hurting or helping my company. Now, if I could drive that rate down to call 10%, 5%, whatever, the numbers don't really matter in this case, but if I could reduce that, now what that does is now that $85,000 a year, maybe that's only $40,000 a year. And now I've just really kind of built up some revenue from the HR side of things. And this is how HR can be a true profit center for the business. Okay, so there's the big six KPIs for HR. In my mind, anyways, again, you can, you can always add and subtract a whole bunch of these things because, again, it really depends upon your organization as a whole. But what can I do to shift these things? I mean, what can I do to really drive manageable and measurable results? Well, actually, I think just three kind of, uh, I guess, best practices, I would say. And number one is really embrace leverage and technology. And the second one's going to be take a holistic employee well-being approach. And the third thing would be really focus on HR collaborating and establishing partnerships within other departments, within the other CXO, so to speak. And so let's get into number one. So as the old adage says, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so how can you really adjust and change a lot of these metrics if you don't embrace the technology and leverage the capabilities of it. You know, there's actually a great report um, saying that NASA is actually changing its approach on people analytics. And this article kind of points out that they are shifting to what they call a graph database versus a relational database. I and mean, what does all this mean, right? So a graph database is simply this. Very simply, a graph database is a database designed to treat the relationships between data and equally important to the data itself. It is intended to hold data without constricting it to the predefined model. Instead, the data is stored like we first draw it out, showing how each individual entity connects with or is related to others. So when I look at the structure of a graph database, and you can see how a lot of times this probably plays out and more so with a, call it a project manager, you know, kind of role. Or here's a new product that's coming online. Here's all the individual pieces that are coming into the node, so to speak, or coming into the nucleus for this product launch and so forth. Now, can we do this with people technology? And the answer is absolutely yes, we can. You see, because if we take each team, right? If we take each node and start looking at them as how does this person you know, affect these different silos and different organizations, very quickly you can see how each employee is really affected and works and collaborates with other different nodes. And so is this really going to help though? I mean, when you look at this, I mean, Josh Burson, again, one of the thought leaders in HR kind of said this about graph technology, and that is graph technology, graph database technology is starting to emerge as a tremendous technology for HR. The problem here, though, is that HR departments want an off-the-shelf product. And so the problem now is that it's coming along slowly. And Burson continues here, I think in 10 years, all HR systems will use some form of graph technology for sure, but it's slow to build because it takes vendors three to five years to build off-the-shelf products that capture the hearts of conservative companies. Now, again, this is great. I mean, again, looking into the future, but really for a couple of vendors in the marketplace, this technology is already in play with their HR and their payroll and their benefit administration, all those different technologies are out there. There's companies that are already doing this. You know, if I just take a look at how graphs and relational databases kind of work, there's a big difference between the two. And I think the great thing here is that you don't really, again, you don't really need to make a big shift, right? I mean, it comes down to that thought process, right? Instead of rows and columns and here's A, B, C down below, if you have a node with a, a team built around it, that's kind of a lot of times how we do work anyways. And so do you need the off the shelf? It's sure nice to have, but this is more so how you structure your organization. Instead of going the typical sideload and, you know, departmentalized approach, as HBR points out, the rise of super teams is really going to drive the future of business. So moving on to the second way to drive these KPIs forward, you really have to take that holistic employee well-being approach. You know, of course, the past year has given a ton of surveys and tons of, uh, of you know, results as far as all these studies that are done. And, and frankly, there's a lot of conflicting data. You know, some studies say that, you know, this pandemic has really streamlined and automated processes and really driven up productivity. And others have said completely the opposite. You know, the February survey from corporate training company Vital Smarts found that remote work can have 
a harmful effect on workplace communication. Workplace culture has also suffered as a result of remote work. Now, again, I mean, that's an example of kind of some bad situations, but, you know, then there's other surveys like this right here. You know, recent surveys also indicate that employers that do not allow for workers to continue remote work post-pandemic will likely lose a lot of their employees post-pandemic. And so here you are, you're with these conflicting kind of data. And so which one's right? Which one's wrong? Well, again, going back to the all informative answer of it depends. Again, that's kind of right, actually, uh, because you see a lot of companies have incorporated, you know, virtual coffee chats and support groups for mental well-being and so forth. And and some have actually established team rituals and they've celebrated accountability and everything else like that. And, and again, I think these are great measures. These are great things to incorporate in your business if you're not already currently doing that. You see, establishing routine, establishing some type of accountability system, whether it's a, you know, a buddy member and or a smaller group of team, that way you're not collectively in a group of 50, you can't really have conversations that way. You know, having these type of support groups is a fantastic way to build camaraderie, to build kind of that co-ownership of your work. But I truly feel that the best way to drive camaraderie and, and teamwork and, and that co-ownership of your business is through accountability. Hold the people accountable for doing the work and achieving their expected outcomes, but trust employees and other hybrid team members to do the work in a way that works for them. You see, I think it's very important for business to understand that people work differently. You know, I had a boss when I was in the army and she said this years ago, but it's always stuck to me. And that was, she told me one time, Dustin, I don't care about the labor. Just show me the baby. You know, and I think that just kind of fits a lot of my mentality. And that is, hey, if I know what needs to be done, just give me the resource and the time to do it and then let me run with it. You know, I think people complain about being micromanaged, but then again, it's usually the ones that need to be micromanaged that are micromanaged, if that makes sense. But anyways, and I think just with the business and the market completely shifting this past year, and I think a lot of people have kind of put people remote and working from home and all that kind of stuff without the proper conditions, so to speak, right? And so so it's very important that if an employer doesn't have a remote work policy in a handbook already, or even as a standalone policy, they need to add that immediately. And so that brings us to our third and final um, ways to kind of drive these KPIs. And that is by HR truly taking a partnership and collaborative role with the other departments. So if I look at the other, called the CXOs, right? So if I look at the CFO, now a lot of times, again, most business era, all these kind of departments are siloed. You know, you're over here and you're over there and you guys do your own thing and, and then we'll just have a meeting around the table and that's all we do. But see, if HR can truly collaborate and kind of partner with a lot of these organizations. Again, let's go back to the CFO, for instance, right? So a lot of the KPIs that we mentioned above, like controlling turnover and controlling absentee, a lot of those things do affect the CFO. And now the problem is a lot of the systems that we have and a lot of the technology we have, they don't, they don't communicate. They don't integrate together. And, and so what you have is you have two different people doing their own KPIs and really driving their own metrics and yet not driving together the mission statement and the initiatives of the company overall. So again, if we could use the CFO as, as an example, by partnering with HR and with HR partnering with the CFO, they could really drive those metrics to reduce costs, reduce overhead, but also drive revenue. So if they could do that, then you also have call it the CIO, the, the information, the IT side of things, right? Again, HR is becoming more and more data and analytics driven. In order to do that, you need technology. And so if the CTO or the CIO or the HR, I mean, if they're not communicating together, what a huge miss that is. Because one has to implement the services that HR needs. And how are these? How are they supposed to know what is needed and how it's supposed to play out if they don't actually communicate? So again, you could have all these different things that have those communications, but if they're not talking and they're still siloed, they're missing out on a lot. Now again, find the CEO, the president, their main goal is to drive profit for that business. But until the CEO realizes that the HR department can and really is a true analytical and data-driven profit driver instead of a sunk cost, which it most likely is, if you could make that shift at the CEO level and bring that HR person on board, great things are going to happen. And so the HR person needs to build those relationships, really needs to partnership and collaborate with all of the different departments, but they can't do that if they're not given a seat at the table. So there you have it. 
six HR initiatives and KPIs in 2021. Uh, I try to remain as market and industry specific uh, agnostic as much as as much as possible. And I hope this does help. I'd love to kind of talk to you down below if you have any comments or questions, concerns. I'm always free to reach out. Um, as and as always, best wishes. Be awesome. Take care. Hey guys, I hope you found that video uh, kind of intriguing and thought provoking as far as ways to drive HR forward in 2021 and beyond. If you liked it, hit subscribe and, and like, comment as well. Love to talk to you down in chat. Love to know your feedback and what you guys think and what you guys feel about it. And as always, if you're looking for more content about the workforce dynamics that are shifting and everything, we got videos and playlists here you can click on as well. Best wishes. Take care.